My name is David Haynes. I am a Phase Two resident at Renewal Ranch. I'm also one of the newest members to the team. Uh, my title is the bunkhouse leader. I live with the Phase One guys. Um, we eat, sleep, and live together. And um, I'm forever thankful to James Loy and the ranch and the opportunity to be a minister of Christ. Um, we're going to move into this, por this portion of our service. Uh, it's called the Word of God. And so this is what changes the life of a drug addict into a mighty man of God. Uh, it's not by bare knuckling and trying harder. It's not through wishing that things would change. It's the Word of God that transforms us from the inside out. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, and He came, and He lived among us. And we look at uh, David in the Psalms. David says, how can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to your word. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Hebrews 4, 12, it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and intentions and thoughts of the heart. And so when we look at that, when we read the Word at the ranch, uh, in phase one, we're exposed to over 500 hours of Bible study. Some people refer to it as drinking the gospel from a fire hose for the first six months of your stay there. And we present the gospel day after day to the men, and we reveal the truth that we're in desperate need of a Savior, that our hearts are wicked and sinful, and that it's, it's nothing that we can do to change that. It has to be a touch from the God, from the Lord. It has to be the Holy Spirit to reveal this and to show us that we're in desperate need, that we can't fix ourselves. But we also show them that there's hope, that there's a solution to the sin problem, and that hope has a name, and His name is Christ Jesus. And so we introduce people to their sin. We help them to see that uh, through love, through truth, and sometimes that truth in love is difficult. Um, sometimes I know in my life, when people expose the truth in the lies that I believed and the manipulation and the selfishness that was in my life, I didn't want to hear the truth. I didn't want to hear that it was, it was me that made these choices. It was me that was manipulating my family. Um, the world teaches us that it's uh, a disease, that we can't help it, that we were born that way, that it's a product of our environment. But I'm here to tell you that I was not raised in church. I don't come from a Christian family. I'm what people might call a first-generation Christian. But the generational curses have been broken off of my life through the truth and through God's Word. And so I can stand before you today and I can say that it's only through Christ and His Word and what He's done in my life that I'm even breathing. I'm, I'm dependent on the Lord for the next breath that I take physically, but I'm also dependent upon the Lord for the next... Um, the next moment in His Word, the next moment in prayer. My spiritual life is just as in need as my physical life. And so I can't take for granted that I read my Bible yesterday. I don't need to read it today. I prayed yesterday. I'll be okay for a couple of days. It's a daily walk with the Lord. It's not um, a checklist. It's not a box that I, I'm trying to uh, check off so that I can get to the next phase. I am dependent on Christ for every single thing in my life. Um, and that's what we teach these men. And we meditate on the scriptures. We, we meditate and memorize 44 sections of scriptures. And I don't say 44 verses. We start off with one-liners. Uh, and we're not easy on the men. We don't uh, encourage them to do one verse and come back. You get all 14 verses and you do them all at the same time. Um, and this is what transforms our life. And so I've got three men that have been meditating on some scriptures. And they're going to come share with you. Um, and I just want to say we thank you for having us here, for the opportunity to come and share what the Lord is doing in our life. And we thank you for partnering with Renewal Ranch. Amen, Dave. Good morning, First Baptist Hot Springs. Uh, my name is Matt Johnson. I am from Memphis, Tennessee. I thought I'd get an amen on that or something. <laughs> uh, I was kind of like Dave. I came up in a home uh, totally dysfunctional. Uh, my dad was an addict. I saw him die with AIDS and as, as an addict. Uh, 
just completely no church in my life until I found Renewal Ranch. And I got saved, come, come to Renewal Ranch, I got, my, I got saved. And uh, my verse today is I'm hitting you with, they, I'm hitting you with one of the one-liners because I get up here, I'm liable to my memory. I'm still working on the memory. But uh, it means so much to me because it's where I'm at right now. Uh, it's Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And... Uh, Thank God for the butts in the Bible, because that but right there tells me, but overcome evil with good. It tells me I can overcome it. I can defeat evil. And that's where I'm at in my life. Every day I wake up, I choose to live today. I was that man that was in the tomb. I was dead. I was dead. Somebody told me God didn't come. Uh, Jesus did not come to make bad guys good, but he came to make dead guys alive. Amen. And that's what I am today, y'all. I'm alive. And I'm going to say it like this, my man. Uh, Russ Purvis here, one of the uh, staff and a good friend of mine, he told me one time, and I hope this makes sense to y'all, but this is what I wake up and choose every day. In my mind, it's a battle. That mind's a battlefield. But I wake up every day, and I choose. I got this old path. I, you know, when you're a kid, you take this path like cutting to the store or whatever. You beat it down. Eventually, it looks like a sidewalk because you've taken that path so much. And I had been taking that path of just wrongdoing my whole life. That path was just beat down and be down. But now I got this new path I'm taking. There's grass growing up, but I'm steady, just steady taking that path and beating a little bit of it down every day. And whereas that old path is starting to grow grass now. And so eventually I'm not looking at that old path anymore. And eventually this new path is going to be beat down and I can take it and the old path's going to be gone. So, and that's where I'm at today. And I thank y'all and I thank churches like y'all. When I come to churches like this that are rejoicing for guys like me that have been saved, I'm like that demon possessed man that Jesus came to and uh, the pig, you know, and he threw all their pigs in the water. I, I, I praise God for churches like, because those people were mad because their pigs was in the water. And God gave them pigs anyway. He, he take the, you know, he'll take it away. And so I praise God for churches like you that make guys like me feel good because uh, y'all rejoice that we are being saved and God is changing lives. I thank y'all. Hey. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> hey. I want, I want to introduce this. This next guy coming up, his name's Ken Wadley, and it, but he's one of the most gentlest and kind people I've ever met. But he's our piano man, and I, I'll put my piano man up against anybody's piano man. <laughs> you know I had to put that out there. I love you. I love you. I love you. That's fine. All right. Thank you. That's Memphis. All right. Yeah, my name's Ken Wadley. I'm from Jonesboro, Arkansas, and I'm 52 years old, and I've been at the ranch for uh, going on five months. And uh, the scripture that I'm going to share with you today is Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, 21. And uh, it says, and do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the, the Spirit. Uh, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always uh, and for everything to God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, um, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And uh, I tell you, I spent a lot of years making music for um, the wrong reasons and uh, I praise God. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, uh, he's put a new song in my mouth of praise to our God. Many will see it and fear him. And uh, I just thank the Lord for Renewal Ranch and for, uh, for the opportunity that he's given me to, um, uh, to draw close to him and to hear his voice and to spend time in his word and to enjoy his, uh, his fellowship. You know, uh, the, vo the scripture in Ephesians Talks, talks about do not get drunk with wine. And uh, I'll tell you, um, fellowship and uh, in the Holy Spirit with brothers in Christ, it's better than any kind of uh, intoxication that the world has to offer. It is. And uh, anyway, thank y'all. It's good to be here with you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I should have introduced you, John. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is uh, John Murphy. I'm 44 years old. I'm from Bentonville, Arkansas. And I've also been at the ranch for almost five months. Uh, the scripture I'd like to share with you today is uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
and says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may be able to discern the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And um, I didn't grow up in a family that used uh, or drank, and none of that was there. Uh, but I did have an abusive mother, and unfortunately my father took his life. Uh, and that led me into drinking, smoking weed, and methamphetamines. And uh, I battled that for 18 years, and I was in darkness. And then the first time in my life uh, that uh, things just got so bad and so dark that I fell to my knees, and I reached my hands out, reached my hands out to God uh, for the first time with a whole heart, with true intentions, and asked him to do with me what you will and put me where you want me, and I am yours. And uh, that led me to the Renewal Ranch and the Word of God. And uh, they're right. They, they feed it to you like a fire hose. But my heart is open to it. My mind is open to it. And Renewal Ranch has taken that hardness off of my conscience and my heart, my spirit, and uh, has restored me. And, uh, you know, that's what that verse, you know, uh, means to me. I felt like that's what I did when I prayed out to God. That, that was my first spiritual worship with my body to my God. And uh, I, I'm just so full of joy and thankfulness now and happy, you know, and uh, uh, I'm becoming the man that I, I should be and will be. And uh, I attribute that to Renewal Ranch. And thank you very much. Thank you, man. It's always encouraging to hear uh, the Phase One residents. Um, we see them when they come in, and what the world has done to them, and what their sin has done to them. And then we see men proclaim the gospel with a light in their eyes, uh, and the darkness is gone. So this portion, this portion of our uh, service is called our identity in Christ. Who am I? I'll think about who I was when I came to the ranch, and what my identity was wrapped up in. Uh, and I'll share a short part of my story. I got saved in 2004, but I also grew up under the prosperity gospel. And so I thought that the Lord's blessing were blessings of the world, money, uh, careers, physical things. And that was all fine as long as my life matched what the prosperity gospel preached. And so uh, I worked at the railroad. Um, I had a, a pretty good job. I was a good husband. I was a good father. I was a good church member. I was all of these things. Um, and then some things happened in my life that didn't match the prosperity gospel. I lost my job at the railroad. Um, I was laid off. And then my daughter got sick. And she chose an alternative lifestyle and homosexuality. And so I lost my identity as a railroader and a good worker. And I lost my identity as a good father. And because of these things, uh, my behavior changed as a husband. And I, was no longer a good husband. And so as the Lord and my selfishness um, stripped these identities away, I stood before uh, the mirror and I didn't know who I was and I didn't know what I wanted out of life. And I knew that I was hurting and I was confused. And so I made a choice to stop trusting the Lord and I went back into my addiction. I trusted the last thing that I'd found comfort in before I got saved. But since coming to the ranch, I have a new identity. And it's not a railroader, it's not a husband, it's not a father, it's a child of the Most High God. Um, and as Paul says, I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Um, not that we don't have physical needs, but I have a burden for the men that struggle with addiction like I did. I have a burden to proclaim the gospel and to tell other people that there is a way. There is a way out of the darkness, there is a way out of whatever the situation is that your sin has us entangled in. Um, Jesus Christ is our hope. And so, um, when men come to the ranch, we have them think about their old life before they met Christ. And then what your new life is that you found in Christ. And so we have a cardboard testimony, and on one side it'll have three names of what the man used to be. And then when they flip it over, it'll be three names of what the new creation is through Christ Jesus. 
Um, and so when you look at these men and you look at the words on these cardboards, I just want you to find hope that the people that you know, whether it's your family member, your coworker, your church member, the people that struggle with addiction, um, there is a better way. And Renewal Ranch has found it. And it's not a 12-step program. It's a one-step program. And step one is Christ. Amen, David. Amen, church. Good morning. All right. Let's give those guys another hand. Yes. All right. All right. My name is uh, Russ Purvis, and uh, I am, too, a graduate of Renewal Ranch. Uh, I spent 15 years uh, in a lifestyle uh, of addiction, and it was only by God's grace, His mercy, that he delivered me from that addiction. So today I serve on staff as a pastoral shepherd to these men, and it is an honor and privilege to do that, and God asked me to do that, and it's something I hold dearly. And so this morning, if you want to turn your Bibles to Lamentations, yes, Lamentations, and if you look right in the middle of Lamentations, two and a half chapters prior and two and a half chapters afterwards, we find Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 26. And this will be this morning's devotion where we'll draw from Scripture. And, and what is unusual about this is something that, it, of course, anytime you speak or give God's Word, it is, it is driven by what God reveals to you. And actually, this is the first time I've given a message from Lamentation. So I hope it, uh, it hit home. It hit home to me, and it gave me some... Uh, uh, um, remembrance of where I was at one time. Now, addiction is dark. It is very, very dark. It's isolation. It's loneliness. It's uh, most of the time, if not, it is without hope. But let's just bring this home for, for a moment. Yes, it's alcohol. And yes, it's addiction to drugs. But let's just boil it down, let's filter it through and call it for what it is, and it's sin. And if we all look at ourselves at some point in our life, and not even maybe today, that we have lived in sin. Yes, we've all lived in sin. And it is only by the blood of Christ and His redemptive power that can draw us out from that sin, can transform us from darkness to light. And that is a beautiful and wonderful thing. And so if you read through the book of Lamentations in its five different poems, and it's about a dark place in the time of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem and its people. It is comparable during this time that it was Jerusalem's 9-11. It was a result of the sin of the people and even their priests that drew God to punishment and consequences of their sin. And so this morning, I will deliver what God has asked me to deliver, a devotion expressing not only the time in 586, but also of today and how God's grace and mercy and love can deliver darkness into light. So if you want to look at Lamentations, again, the central scripture verse, or scripture passage is from uh, Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 26. So for a moment, for a moment, let us imagine ourselves at home, or maybe at our workplace, or even at church, and suddenly we are surrounded by enemy forces. And that enemy force does not immediately evade or attack, but sets its perimeters that cut off food supply, water supply, and the basic needs to live. And over a period of time, the living conditions become so unbearable that the will to live seems hopeless, and you're filled with desperation. And over a period of time, the living conditions become so unbearable that the will to leave seems hopeless and you're filled with desperation, resulting in impending death or surrender to slavery. This is the effect of sin and its consequences. 
The siege warfare of the adversary. This is the siege war of the adversary. And in 15, 586 B.C., this was the plight of the city of Jerusalem as described in Lamentations by the weeping prophet Jeremiah and his lament, which is a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. The tragedy, the tragedy. If only the people have listened to the words of the prophet, if tragedy, if the, if the people would, not, would have listened to the words of the prophet. Jeremiah had been preaching for 40 years to his fellow Jewish people of the pending judgment of God due to their rebellion and sin and idolatry. Unfortunately, unfortunately, none listened or repentant of their sins. As a result in God's judgment and his discipline, the consequences of sin ensued. He allowed the Babylonians to take siege of the city of Jerusalem for 18 months. Eventually, the walls of the city were breached, and the incurring invasion began. The Babylonian army burned and destroyed every building and every structure within the city, including the temple, which was looted with all its gold, silver, and copper. Many of the Jewish people who were weak, sick, and humiliated were brutally murdered or taken into slavery and led back to Babylon. Some were left to pick up the remains without any purpose or direction. This was the consequences of sin and the separation from God that resulted in total destruction and depravity. And the sin of that day, and the sin of that day is the sin of today. The rebellion against God, though not immediate, will lead to the darkness of the soul. And the natural result is guilt. And the natural result of guilt is shame, which leads to bitterness, anger, anxiety, depression, and eventually isolation and loneliness. And it becomes a vicious cycle of despair. And the protective walls of our lives are broken down, and the enemy comes in and destroys and overtakes everything that we value. And we become a slave to what will eventually lead to our death. But hope. But hope. As Jeremiah penned his lament in a cave known as Jeremiah's Grotto, which was on a hill north of Jerusalem, he could see the war zone of destruction, the smoldering flames, the ashes of debris, the bodies left to decay, and the rest of the people led away to Babylon as slaves. And in his broken heart, and his broken heart, sitting on this hill, you can picture him sitting out, looking over the destruction, and he lifts his head up. And his heart and his grief, and he looks up, and he's crying, he's weeping. And he remembers God's mercy. Remembers God's mercy. His covenant love, his loving kindness, and his loyal love. Loyal love. And in the middle of the lament, we find this shining diamond. From Lamentations 3, 19 through 26. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him. To those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation from the Lord. Amen. So to fully understand, to fully understand the magnitude of God's love and mercy. So to fully understand the magnitude 
of God's love and mercy. The hill on which Jeremiah wrote this poem is also known as Skull Hill. Or in Greek, it is known as Calvary. And as God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son, he would be crucified on this very hill some 600 years later for the sins of the world. And on that Sunday morning, when the two Marys went to the tomb, on that Sunday morning when the two Marys went to the tomb from Luke, they found that the stone had been rolled away. The mercies of God never cease, and His faithfulness endures. For His Son, Jesus Christ, has given us victory over death. And the forgiveness and power over sin. There is freedom in His name. For there is no distinction, no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who gives us hope, not only for eternity, but gives us meaning for life. Renewal Ranch, men, church family, is this your morning of mercy? Amen. Thank you. Good morning. I'm James Law. I'm the executive director of Renewal Ranch Ministries. And what I was going to share with you this morning, I changed because of what Memphis shared about these uh, different roads and paths that uh, we could be on. And um, I felt like the Lord was uh, wanting me to share this. Um, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Many of us, myself included, spending 23 years in an addiction, was on that wide road that led to destruction. And I was fortunate that somebody loved me enough when I didn't love myself to share the good news and to share some truth with me and help me turn down and go on a different path. And there's this little illustration I carry with me and it's called the sidewalk trap. And it says, I walk down a street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. It hurts. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It takes forever to get out. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I fall in. Now it's a habit. It really hurts. I'm embarrassed, full of shame. My eyes are open to where I am. I guess it is my fault. I get out immediately. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. I walk down a different street. 
I take a different path. At Renewal Ranch, we have a privilege of working with men and their families who have been on a wide path of destruction in their life. And just like I was, I had no idea of a way of escape that God had provided for me. But someone was gracious enough to share with me that way of escape. And so we started our program in 2011, and we were helping eight men. Currently, we're helping over 70 men and their families. This is just the phase one part of our program. We have two other phases, and those phases are in church this morning because we encourage the men to get involved in church and get a home church and start attending and participating and serving in the local body of Christ. Because we're not a church, but we want to be a servant branch to churches like First Baptist Church, Hot Springs. Because everywhere we go across this state, everywhere in this nation, it's hard to find anyone that doesn't have someone in their circle of influence that isn't struggling in addiction. I believe that this is the number one mission field in the United States today. The enemy is using addiction to tear up the fabric of our communities and our family. In that same period of time since 2011, we have had over 400 adult men come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Give the Lord some praise. Countless family members. We have started our family counseling, family classes, family Bible reading plans, where shepherds like Rush and these other shepherds that God has brought, because we're trying to make disciples that make disciples. So I'm surrounded by 11 program staff members who have gone through our program, and now God has brought on the other side. And just like Russ is working on his master's degree, uh, so many of my staff have already gotten higher education degrees in the areas of ministry, and that's one thing that we have is uh, we have a Renewal Ranch Educational Endowment, and that's to help these men. We gave out $10,000 in scholarship last year, and we've already given out $2,500 this year and fixing to give another one here in the next few weeks to help men pursue higher education degrees so that they can be better equipped to share that good news and minister and love on these men and their families. We also have started our alumni aftercare program where we try to stay better connected with our alumni. And we have alumni fellowships every other month. And we feature some graduates, what's going on in their lives. We've got one that just got back from Matamoros, Mexico on a mission trip, one that's fixing to uh, start law school. So we'll feature them. Uh, we'll talk about some pop-up testimonies about what the Lord's doing in their lives. But we want to stay connected with the men and their families. We let them bring their men, their, uh, their uh, families with them, their wives, their children. And so it is an incredible work that the Lord is doing. Because we are faith-based, unashamedly so, Christ-centered, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus and we're going to teach these men God's word and we're not going to deter from that. It's so important that churches like First Baptist Church, Hot Springs, the body of Christ come alongside us and help us in this endeavor. Right now, on our campus, we are building a 40-man apartment complex. I think we've got some pictures of that um, that's being built right now. This building, these buildings are in the dry. They have their roof on it. Um, they will house 40 more men on our campus, and this will be our phase two facility, and this will be all of our uh, phases will be on one campus. And so we're on our way to helping over 100 men and their families. And that's going to happen in God's timing and with his provision. And this is an important work. If you look at what is going on in our country, in the United States, we spent $600 billion last year on addiction, addiction recovery, treatment, education, prevention, and detox. In that same time period, 100,700 Americans lost their lives to drug overdoses. That's 295 people a day. There's 7 million children living in the United States 
that are growing up with one or both of their parents addicted to drugs. And it simply does not have to be that way because we have an answer to that sin problem, that heart condition, those things that are driving that addictive behavior, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we have such a privilege to be able to share that and to be able to witness what the Lord is doing and to watch children get their fathers back. Wives get godly husbands back. Homes get spiritual leadership back. God raised up men to be the spiritual leaders in their homes. 85% of youths in prison come from fa fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 25 million children live without a biological father in their home. 60% of youth suicide comes from fatherless homes. This is an important work. These guys right here have about 70 kids. This matters. Those children matter. Jesus said, whatever you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. I was one of those least of these. And in 2005, after 13 different rehabs and 23 years in addiction, God radically changed my life when I waved the white flag and said, God, I can't, but I believe you can. Guys, thank you for letting us come. Thank you, Brother John. Um, I've spoke to your mission team a couple of weeks ago and shared our one, three, and five-year strategy and our 20-year uh, outlook that we have for the ministry. Dr. Henry Blackaby in The Experiencing God says, find out where God's at work and join him in those efforts. I can promise you that your investment in these men and their family's life is making an eternal difference and God's at work. And so I thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. And I'm going to close out our time this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Ken to come up here. And I would be remiss... As we travel around, I'm going to have Ken uh, pray. And if you guys want to just stand with me, we won't make this a, a long, drawn-out deal. But as we travel the state of Arkansas, everywhere we go, if you know someone in your circle of influence that just might be struggling in an addiction that God is laying on your heart this morning, would you just indicate that by just raising your hand. Somebody in your family, a co-worker, hands going up all across the congregation. My sister prayed for me for 23 years, believing that if God got a hold of my life, that my life would radically change. And man has it ever. And so I know that it's not just that person in the addiction. I know that it's family members that are struggling too. So I just want to open up this altar and I want to close this time out. Would you have the courage just to come up here and stand in the gap for that one that's struggling in addiction that God has laid on your heart? Maybe you are struggling and you've heard this message of hope. Let me tell you that you've never gone too far that the good Lord's hand can't bring you back into the fold. And you don't have to pull yourself together to be good enough to come to God. He wants to meet you right where you are. And he's not mad at you. And he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. Maybe you need a great home church. And you want to come up and join this body of believers. Brother John is up here. But I'm just going to open up this altar. And if you would, I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for that person that God has laid on your heart. And maybe you don't have somebody that's in your family, and maybe you've experienced and come on the other side of addiction, and maybe you just want to come up here and thank God for the freedom that we have from his work on the cross. So the altar is open. If you'd like to come up, um, I'd love the privilege of praying for you.